everyone and welcome to Chatty AF, the Anime Feminist Podcast. My name's Amelia, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Anime Feminist and I'm joined today by Dee Hogan and Peter Fobian. If you guys would like to introduce yourselves. Hi, yeah, I'm Dee, I'm the Managing Editor over at Anime Feminist. Uh, I also run the anime blog The Jose Next Door and you can find me on Twitter at Jose Next Door. And I'm Peter Fobian, I'm an Associates Features Editor at Crunchyroll and a Contributor and Editor at Anime Feminist. Today we're looking at the mid-season check-in for the winter 2018 season. Um, at the beginning of the season, we review every premiere that's eligible. We have a premiere digest, which we'll link to in the show notes for this. And we'll, we categorise them depending on how feminist-relevant or feminist-friendly these shows are. So we're going to go through those categories today and just see which ones we're keeping up with, what our opinions of them are at the moment, and what our recommendations are to watch or to avoid like the plague um speaking of which (laughs) let's get stuck in at the deep end we have the lowest categories on the list the least uh likely to be recommended anime was a mistake uh the duo's work is never done either of you watching that oh no no i couldn't even get through the first episode (laughs) so no i actually made it through the first episode but i wasn't super tempted to continue so i'm i'm quite happy (laughs) not prioritizing that one um Pit of shame category, Killing Bites. Watching that? No. Anyone? Mm. Peter? It didn't um. capture my my interest. uh. (laughs) That's very diplomatic. Okay, Red Flags category, Death March to the Parallel World Rhapsody, which I understand Uh, is doing very well. Of course it is. It's an isekai light novel series. Yep. (laughs) Fantasy video game isekai. I actually watched uh, everything that's available yesterday. And anything our listeners should know about? Um, l- lots of, uh, like, I guess, slavery apologia. Uh, okay, I think the we guy can kind stop of has there. this a... yeah, <laughs> internal monologue. It's like, well, so long as they're happy, then is slavery wrong? That kind of thing. Ooh, right. So not even just red flags anymore. That could probably be relegated down into a pit of shame or possibly anime was a mistake. We'll come back to that. Yeah, we, um, we had heard that was going to happen. And when we were ranking them, we thought about putting Death March in the pit of shame. But we were like, okay, just based on the first episode, we exactly. will just put it under red flags. Um, but yeah, we, happens, we had heard that was coming. So That happens a lot with our categories is that we, we do hear of what's to come, especially stuff that's based on a manga. It's based on a light novel. But we absolutely can't judge on anything but the first episode or yeah. whatever's been aired at that time yeah. well partly because so, you don't know what the anime is going to do um exactly yeah. you know they may they may decide to make um, some changes sounds like they did not hear so <laughs> more bad so, things yeah into the pit into the pit death march goes and the final red flag series is when we do have to talk about which mm. is after the rain yeah i guess we do <laughs> have to talk about it don't this? we I, I know Peter's not. I am one episode behind, but yeah, okay. I have been following it um, not so much out of personal enjoyment, but more kind of intellectual curiosity, I guess. Um, it's very popular. It in really is. The, the kinds of circles we're in, the kind of anime critic discussion circles. Yeah. It's It's got a lot of discussion about it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> Sorry. Are you... I mean, how are you finding? Because the the big red flag of that is this high school girl. She's in love with her middle aged manager, and she is, from our perspective, she's not the viewpoint character. So it, we actually, the show actually does try to put you into the manager's head, Mr. Kondo, mm-hmm. and the girl Akira. She is. We we watch her a lot. We we look at her. We see her. We don't get inside her head. We don't hear her thoughts. We see through her eyes sometimes and she has a tendency to rose tint her boss and his life which is sweet and to be expected um but she herself is presented as this this almost ethereal figure and that has that has felt a bit uncomfortable to us i know we've talked internally how do you feel about that at this point in the series i know you said you want to sit behind uh no that's still about where i am um I'm, i'm getting to the point where my uh sort of distaste for what the show is doing with the way it presents and frames Akira and Kondo is kind of overriding the, the sort of, again, that kind of curiosity interest I had in it. Um, the more I see the puppet strings, the less, the less enjoyment I can get out of it. Um, so, I mean, I've, I'm working on a piece on it, which will probably get published in the next few weeks. Um, so, I could talk about it like a lot, but I don't want to take up too much time yes. on a red flag show. 
I feel kind of the same way, except I've had the opposite trajectory to you. The more I watch, the more I actually do get into it and enjoy it. Um, I think because the way I see it is that it started off being presented as Akira's story. It's a story about a young girl. And so it felt jarring to be put in Kondo's mindset so much. But actually, six weeks in, it feels much more like his show and Akira is kind of a separate character we, we look at. And if I look at it from that perspective, I like it a lot more. And it just kind of feels like they've set it up as as looking like it's her story in order to not be a Woody Allen show, effectively. Doesn't that um, just make it a Manic Pixie Dream Girl show, though? I'm not sure I'd call her a Manic Pixie Dream Girl. I don't think she's quirky enough for that. She, I think she is a relatable character in some ways. I think she, the way she goes about her crush... She's more determined than I think I was at that age. Like she's really clear with him and she expresses her feelings and she makes sure that he understands. But she doesn't do anything that's like super quirky or any of those kind of hallmarks of the Manic Pixie Dream Girl. Just plain Dream Girl though, because this beautiful high schooler is so into him and she's so expressive about her affection and she, in one very uncomfortable moment, it turns out she's really motherly and she's a good cook and she goes to his home and she cooks for a son and it's that that felt kind of uncomfortable. But on the other hand, the episode D hasn't seen yet has some interactions between them that are much more kind of down to earth and like they take that romantic element out entirely from his side, at least. And in many ways, he's kind of he he doesn't do anything that I get frustrated with. He does sometimes, but for the most part, he's just been kind of pulled into her fantasy and he doesn't really want to be there. He's enjoying the way it makes him feel, but he's also conscious that there's kind of no good way for it to end. So I, I think there's stuff to like, but I think it belongs in the red flag category. I do have one question while we're on it. Uh, I've seen like two screenshots. One, or like it was a short clip that looked like she was hiding in his closet or something. And then another yep. one that looked like it was his office through a keyhole does she like stalk him or something she goes to his house um she basically she takes her son home she goes to his house and he says hey i've got a great idea wouldn't it be funny if you hid in the closet when daddy comes home and she hides Mm. and then the little boy forgets to call her out so she just ends up sat there and looking through the keyhole into his office which is yeah it's it's not creepy but it's also it crossed a line for me it felt a little bit implausible and this was after the whole she cooks him his son a meal thing and it all just felt a bit a bit uncomfortable it felt really cringeworthy for me when she goes to his house and he's left like his socks on the floor and stuff and I felt really bad for him so again if I can accept it as a condo viewpoint show I'm quite okay with it in many ways that makes it so much worse to me (laughs) (laughs) because if it's a condo viewpoint show and it's about a high school girl who's like throwing herself at him that it just it reads like a predator's fantasy and the more it shifts in that direction the creepier and grosser it gets for me and i can't really argue with that (laughs) i'm i'm personally enjoying it more and getting more out of it once i've reframed it that way but yeah it's it is uncomfortable and it your mileage is going to vary on this one i think it's important for people to know but it is absolutely beautiful there is likable stuff about it if you think you can stomach what Dee's mentioned, then by all means give it a go. Um, but this isn't this isn't going to be making any of our feminist recommendation lists, I think, at any point. Okay, we should move on to the next category. Um, yellow flags. So Dee, what was your criteria for this category? Um, yellow. Hmm. It's a it's a gut feeling. No, uh, yellow flags are <laughs> yellow flags are shows where there are definitely some uh, elements that we think could um, are kind of like uh, feminist relevant kind of warning signs that could put people off. Um, that could very quickly like fall down a bad hole um, depending on how they play them, but they were either minor enough or exercised with enough restraint that they didn't feel like large blaring warning signs to us. It was more like if fan service is a complete thing that you don't want in any of your shows then that might be in a yellow flag even if the fan service is fairly minor does that make sense yeah yeah absolutely okay i'm gonna go through the ones i don't think people have seen so have you seen beatless i mean i've seen the first episode of everything on this list but nothing past okay, that okay let's let's say up to up to where we are in the season sure beatless no no nope. uh i got through three episodes i talked about it somewhat angrily in our three uh three episode check-in so i'll direct people to that um i'm not watching it anymore <laughs> 
Okay, the I don't know I don't know how this is pronounced. The American American. <laughs> Sorry, guys, butchered pronunciation. When it's a Japanese title, I can do it, but this yeah. is not. Merchant Mansion. Can you? Thank you. <laughs> uh, anyone watching that? Nope. No, Rai nope. is, but uh, I know Rai couldn't make the call. Um, but they they are keeping yes. up with it. So. Okay, Ms. Kozumi loves ramen noodles. I am. Is it any better? Uh, <laughs> Would you move it from the yellow flag to another category? I guess. Uh, I don't. There's just like uh, probably not. There's a like a lot of <laughs> it's the, the show basically seems to be about that short-haired girl stalking uh, Koizumi as she eats ramen, and hmm. they do a lot of whenever they're eating ramen, they get like a, a blush on their face and make a lot of you know appreciative food wars. Style. Yeah, noise. Uh, and yeah, I mean it's not. Uh, it hasn't really gotten more awful. Like it hasn't like done like changing scenes or bathing scenes yet. Um, to <laughs> to kind time. of like add fan service over what was if like if you watch episode one, it's maintained exactly that quality. I think that's very representative of the rest of the series. <laughs> it's going to be this that's this <laughs> hopeless girl stalking Koizumi and a lot of really kind of uncomfortable eating scenes. Nice. Yeah. Exactly what I want from an anime. Mm. Um, I'm not watching it. Uh, slow start. No. Nope. Anyone? Nope. Okay. Katana Maidens. I think, Peter, you said you have watched this. I watched the first three episodes. Oh, okay. You talked about it in the three-episode check-in? Um, I don't think we covered that one since I was the only one. <laughs> okay. uh, right. I don't think that... Uh, no fan service really comes to mind um, that I can think of. And That's interesting, because our episode one summary line is Battle Maiden series that goes through the fan service emotions with far less bite and discomfort than usual. Hmm. So do you mean it's not reading as as you would expect fan service? Well, I, or I don't recall any... I mean, it seems like one of those shows that would probably kind of do that, but it. I, I remember there were a couple scenes where like they were trying to disguise themselves, so they changed clothes, and uh, it just kind of cut away during that. Um, okay. Uh, and, yeah, so... I was actually somewhat surprised with the first episode. I thought it was pretty good. Um, but it kind of, um, yeah, I can't really think of it, anything super it bad to say about it. yellow flag. <laughs> if you liked the first episode, then you'll also like the rest of it probably. I think uh, okay. the way it frames them is maybe a little um, kind of like, hey, aren't these girls cute? But I don't think yet it is the same thing with Koizumi. It hasn't like done like the the changing scenes where the camera's in all the wrong places or a bathing right. scene with the same situation so yeah. okay so if you battle made in series are your thing then maybe check it out see if it's your, uh, your tolerance level yeah okay uh hakata tonkot's ramens d are you watching this um i was i got i finished episode four i started which was basically the end of the first light novel so it kind of wraps up okay. that that first story arc I started episode five and kind of realized, like, no, I'm happy with the way that first arc ended, and I didn't really have any burning desire to keep <laughs> hanging out with these characters. I've heard some pretty good things about the light novels in terms of, um, like, explicit queer representation, which is cool. Um, so I might go back to it just to kind of keep an eye on that. Um, but I, I kind of fell behind, and I, I, I'm not fully caught up right now. Okay. PC, are you watching that one? Yeah, I'm uh, one episode behind right now. So I guess that means I, ha I have watched five, but not six. Um, mm -hmm. I think it definitely, uh, well, I guess they technically didn't kill that woman, but the, like, the one, like, female hit woman in the show definitely did get, like, just kind of, uh, taken out of the equation very early on. So I think that leaves right. the only actual female character on the cast is a, like, eight-year-old girl who works with the professional torturer guy. Oh. Um, yeah. Okay. She like made his website and everything, and she oh, it's, did. it's weird. That, <laughs> I, yeah. That part was fun. She put he didn't he wanted to advertise, so she made a website for him. Yeah. That's so there, there's these weird they're professional revenge getters. So like if somebody does something to you, they do exactly that thing to them. Uh, and it's this really big bald guy. Uh, this uh, I, I think he's he's a he's a um he's a Latinx like immigrant, I guess. Oh, he is. Okay. Martinez, um, yeah, his yeah. name. That's is... cool. Um, yeah, then the bar owner is is definitely uh, gay coded. Uh, I think he's actually. When I read a character description, it said that he was gay. Um, mm -hmm. And then I guess they both take care of this girl together, who's like, I don't know how yet. She's pretty young. Um, 
And like in once in that same scene, he's talking about how he has to make a princess costume for her for a play that she's going to be in at school, uh, while she's at this <laughs> laptop writing up a uh, like the description for their various torturing services. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so, I mean, like it's kind of funny in that regard. Uh, I'm but kind she of she is the only female character left. Uh, yes. Yeah, and, and uh, right. the show is definitely. I think the last episode made it pretty clear that it's shipping uh, Lynn and um, Bamba, uh, the main detective guy. It. And uh, Lynn is a um, Chinese uh, assassin who cross dresses as a female. Um, okay. And Bamba is like a professional investigator slash hitman. So, um, yeah, it definitely puts them in situations which are supposed to be like quirky and romantic. Okay. So, like, yeah, I I can't say it's been treating women too well. I think it's murdered, like, six or seven of them at this point to show. Oh, great. uh, Yeah, no, it it definitely does that. It definitely does that. The the killer in the first arc was, like, a psychopath who was buying women and then murdering them. Like, that was his thing. Oh, Um, wow. He was the mayor's son or something. Talk about burying the lead. How did that not come up within the first thing that you both said? Well, I think we we talked talked about about that during the three three episode. episode. Yeah, it was a oh, three-episode okay. check-in yeah. a lot, so we didn't feel like we necessarily needed to go straight into it here. Um, the thing is, yeah. and the thing Fair about enough. it, which we mentioned in the three-episode too, is it's it is it is it's it sucks. Obviously, like it's kind of an old trope, but the show is very focused on tracking down the killer and finding him and bringing him to justice. It's not like a bunch of torture por- porn or murder porn. Like you don't see the women okay. suffering; you just know they're dying. Um, okay. So it's again, it's a yellow flag, but it's handled with enough um, restraint that that unless that's just like a straight up deal breaker for you, I don't think it's going to be like a huge issue. Okay. Yeah. Now speaking of restraint, mm-hmm. let me segue to a show that has precisely none of it. Darling in the Franks. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> now this has been perhaps the most talked about show of the season. Oh yeah. I think in again in our little circle of the internet. A lot of people like it, a lot of people talk positively about it, and it has also had its fair share of criticism. And I have continued to be kind of disappointed. I had a moment in episode four, I think it was. Yeah, it was episode four where it it kind of lost me. It lost, it lost it. I lost any faith that it would subvert these very heteronormative gender roles that it had put up. Um, and so I've been watching it since because there are still things I enjoy. I think Zero Two is an amazing character, but there's a moment in episode four where it just completely removes her. Well, it removes her actually from the picture and we're completely focused on, on bland protagonist hero. So I, yeah, I have, I'm continuing to watch it. I've, I enjoyed episode five a great deal. I haven't seen six yet, but Peter, you have, and you said it improves it slightly. Uh, yeah, I think the thing you disliked in four, uh, the way it framed him as like her as being a uh, object by which he could get his wings or whatever. Uh, yeah. It basically said that was <laughs> which a... is something he actually says. Yeah. Yes, uh, it it basically showed you that that is exactly the thing that he should not have been thinking the entire time. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. So we'll keep it vague, yep. but it's not. If you if you get to episode four and you lost faith <laughs> that it was going to do anything subversive, that's probably still true. I don't know if we've seen any evidence yet that it's going to subvert. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's being roles. like super uh, creative or anything, but I do think it's <laughs> definitely uh, established that Zero Two is also a character, not an object, and him and thinking Zero Two about is a really great object was a mistake. Zero Two is probably the best thing about the show i think um and it is it is a beautiful show Um, so i'm i'm continuing to watch it but that was really upsetting for me not upsetting that makes it sound very dramatic but i i thought because it is so on the nose every time it is so on the nose with this whole piloting is sex and these teenagers are actually talking about sex and then it doesn't do anything with that so it just seems like titillation for no purpose I mean, it's apparently a 24-episode series, so we may get some subversion at some point. But if they wanted to do anything with it, if they wanted to really weave it in thematically, they've missed their chance to do that, basically. So from now on, it's going gonna, it's gonna to feel like a twist or some kind of cheap device rather than something that's actually narratively interesting. Mm-hmm. So if you are watching that one, I get it. I'm watching it too. But <laughs> don't expect too much of it, I think would be my advice. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Nothing to add to that. 
All right, let's move on to the next category, harmless fun, which I think is self-explanatory. I am watching a couple of these. Dee, this is a category I know you've seen a few of. Uh, yeah, I'm so uh, just kind of talking about the ones that I've seen that I don't think anybody else on the team is watching. Um, How Can Maybe Kochi is very nice. Um, I'm a couple episodes behind, but I haven't officially dropped it. I just haven't gotten back to it. Um, okay. It doesn't really. I pretty much everything I said in the three episode check in still holds. So I would say go go read that little blurb. Um, I mm-hmm. I would have no no qualms about recommending it to other people. Um, I think if you have kids, it might be a nice one to watch with them um, because it's got oh. it's very much got kind of a storybook feel to it. Um, tons of female characters with like lots of different kinds of jobs and interests. Um, there's like a scientist and a cafe owner and some singers and the one of the main characters is a mechanic. So it's it's nice. It's a very nice little. Uh, family-friendly uh, fairy tale type show. I really like it when we can recommend stuff that people can watch with their kids because that is an email that we get every now and again from somebody saying, thank you for your reviews. They actually make it possible for me to share this thing I love with my daughter. And so I always think that's really that's really nice when we can do that. So we'll have to highlight that in the uh, end of season discussions as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then um, You're also watching... Yeah. Yeah, I'm also watching yeah. How to Keep a Mummy. Peter, Peter are yes. you keeping up with that one too or no? I haven't even watched the first episode. (laughs) Okay, so here's the thing about How to Keep a Mummy. I have almost nothing to say about it, but it's super cute and nice, and it makes me happy every week, and that's pretty much where it is. Um, There's a lot of adorable animals being adorable. And it's kind of like pets, right? Yeah, it's kind of like pets, but then in the most recent episode, um, they've been learning how to write, and they're writing little simplistic messages to their uh, owners. (laughs) So now they're kind of like kids. It's... They're, they're monsters, so it's kind of like in that middle ground between having like a young child and having a pet. It's very cute. It's adorable. Um, again, it's one of those where there's one kind of weird thing where the, the aunt who's sort of looking after the main boy, uh, apparently when she puts on glasses, she becomes kind of like a dominatrix type. Um, oh, which that is, totally happens. As a glasses wearer, I can confirm. Oh, yeah, no, totally. Um, it happens exactly <laughs> once for like, it's like two minutes of one episode, but it's super uncomfortable. Uh, otherwise, the okay. show has been really nice and sweet. And I, again, have um, at it. Okay. Are you watching Idolish 7? No, I'm not. Peter, are you watching that one? Nope. Nope, me neither. Um, hmm, maybe, maybe I should watch a few more of these. I always skip idol shows starring male characters or female characters. So recently, idol I've been shows. Kind of rethinking this. Idol shows in general. It's just <laughs> regardless. It's just never. It, it it never leaves me wanting to watch them. But actually, a huge amount of people do watch them and love them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I've I've started reflecting on this a little, and I think maybe I need to watch a few more and try and understand that a bit better. It's not a genre so, I'm able to get into. Um, I can yes, do music. I can yeah. do music shows sometimes. Like um, I enjoyed Show by Rock. Classicaloid. And I, well, Classicaloid's <laughs> a little different. Classicaloid's like I don't know a magical girl music show. Um, Classicaloid's a little different is <laughs> understatement. Yeah. Um, no, I'm thinking more of that stuff like Show by Rock, which is about like these bands yeah. like and then they fight and stuff um and i got into yeah, that I've one but for that. the most part i have a hard time with just kind of straight realistic um music shows or idol shows so um yeah i'm yeah. not i'm not watching that one which again not, not to I, say there's anything like wrong with the genre just it's not something i've ever been able to get into i know that this is this is something one of my friends is watching and really loves and highly recommends it so um, I'm, i might dive back into that one and see if i can have something to say about it by the end of the season because it Again, there's so many people who love these shows and I never watch them and I'm starting to sort of question whether that's been a, a gap in my own viewing um, education, I guess. Um, from that to something completely different, Junji Ito, either of you watching that? No. Yep. Peter, current... has, it, has it progressed? Uh, I mean, I think we have a, a basic disagreement in our level of enjoyment of the series to begin with. Uh, I, <laughs> I've liked pretty much the whole thing. Uh, yeah. I, I think... Struggled that every episode uh I, I don't know if i want to say that anymore but i think every episode has sort of built on the last one like they're becoming more comfortable doing horror stories um because okay. i think some like around three or four it started getting actually like really good um also it's adapted some of my favorite stories so i'm happy with that um it is doing it a weird thing where it like leaves off some of the stories in different places than the manga uh maybe to encourage you to go find the short story collections or something um, which I'm, I'm not sure how I feel about that, but I think generally they find kind of a mysterious point to leave things off on that leaves you curious about where the story goes. Yeah, so I like it. I've seen there's been a little bit of Sakuga recently, like uh, Creepy Fingers, uh, 
Yeah, I saw the gif of that. It looked great. Yeah, but... Uh, but I think that's that's the kind of thing I really wanted out of this show, is those kinds of visuals. And the first episode's uh, doll funeral, or whatever it was called, that was great, but it was mostly a still image. Yeah, well, so, I mean, Ito's known for the kind of, like, the big panel reveal of yeah, the horrific yeah. thing. Uh, so I think that that's what they're trying to do. Um, but, yeah, making it static as well, um, depending... I think a lot of the shots are somewhat static, but they could be doing more. Have they done a, a Tomie episode? No, they went back to Soichi, though, for some reason. <laughs> um, for those for those unfamiliar with Tomie, she's a schoolgirl who seduces people and they die. So <laughs> that is something we'll probably want to talk about when it happens. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've been kind of keeping an eye out for that, and I hadn't seen any gifts or anything. So I mean, I'll, I'll come back to that. I mean, I'm not I'm not great at keeping up with. Uh, these kind of episodic shows that don't rely on a cumulative story anyway. So, mm. but through no fault of its own, I think. And, and like, as part of the style, there are a lot of like women who get killed or victimized. Uh, but yeah, that's Rai, kind of... Rai was talking about this, about Ito in general. Yeah. is not super feminist friendly, um, but not outright misogynist. But maybe that's a, though maybe that's a conversation we need to have. Maybe that's a, separate podcast entirely because i know ito's body of work is actually huge yeah i can say um, some of the stories have female main characters some of them don't uh there i think generally you do see more weird stuff happen to girls because he loves the contrast between like beauty and horror so um yeah. you'll definitely see a lot of that if you watch the show which is probably my one like warning about it okay good to know um moving on karakai jaws no takagi san no i haven't I seen why this Title wasn't romanized. Uh, wasn't, yeah, sorry, Angleton. I thought that I was an odd choice too. Takaki-san is good at teasing. I think is the the kind of translation there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I tried to watch the first episode and couldn't really get into it. It felt like a lot of vignettes, which isn't really a style that works for me. Neither of you is watching it. I watched. I watched the premiere. <laughs> that was it. So that's it. Yeah, Mitsubishi Colors. Uh, again, I watched the premiere. I kind of thought about coming back to it, but. Um... It was another one that very much, it felt like it was geared maybe for a younger audience in kind of a saucy way. Like, the kids are, are kind of bratty, but um, sort of enjoyably mm-hmm. so. But it's very much about, like, three, eight, three like, eight-year-olds screwing around together. So wasn't quite okay. enough for me to come back to it. That's fair. Peter, you're not watching that one? Nope. Okay. Um, Pop Team Epic. <laughs> Am I the only one, <laughs> Am I the I only think, one watching this? I think so. Yeah, I'm not keeping up with it. <laughs> That's fine. Um... Nothing to add. <laughs> no comment. It continues no to be Pop Team Epic, I would assume. It's, it continues to be Pop Team Epic. And it's it's interesting, but it's not any more interesting than it was one episode in or three episodes in. It is exactly what it tells you it is. And if you liked it, then continue watching it. If you didn't like it, it's not going to get any better for you. Okay, School Babysitters. This is one that we do have to talk about. Yeah. I don't know if either of you is watching that one. I watched the first two episodes and then I dropped it. Um, and I've heard enough about I've heard enough about other things that happen in it that have made me have no desire to go back to it. So let's talk about that character who is an actual pedophile. Um, that's the worst part of this show, as and it's it's such a tonally uh, inappropriate and inconsistent thing. It's every other element of the show is really sweet. It's the, the main story, the main characters are actually recovering from grief. Or the main character, I guess, is recovering from grief and kind of learning how to balance being a, a carer, essentially, for his younger brother. A carer is not quite the right word. A guardian for his younger brother with, at the same time, being a teenager in a new school. And that's it's a good story and he's a good character. And actually, when they do look at his grief, and he, he lost his parents quite recently and he tries to kind of be upbeat about it and not dwell on it but he does dwell on it because he's he's still a child and he's still at school and when they go into that it is always really affecting it's really well handled i like that they've not dropped it very often parents being killed before the first episode is a device just to get them out of the way so you can put this kid into a weird situation but they they make it clear that he's he's really missing his family he's really feeling the weight of responsibility on him and the children are, they, they're cute. They, Kaylin's talked about how accurate they are in her experience as a preschool teacher. And I would concur. I have much younger brothers and sisters and it feels completely resonant with my experience there. But then you have this one character who is an actual pedophile and who is 
treated well by everyone except Inomata, who's the uh, student council president, and she calls him out on it, and she's the only one, and it, that's very awkward. So, yeah, it's, I think it's one of those things, like, if it's an absolute deal breaker for you, then do not watch it, because it doesn't shy away from it, and it does treat it as comedy, that he gets a nosebleed when he sees these kids. But if you can Ugh. stomach it in Ugh. the small doses that it exists in, yeah, no, and I completely get that. Um, he's shown up in two episodes so far, which is two episodes too many, but it, he's not an every episode recurring character. So it is possible to just kind of hold your nose for that. He's kind of my equivalent of Minata in My Hero Academia. It's like if he's in small enough pockets, I can deal with it. When he starts becoming a bit more of a major character, I can't. I, I don't enjoy the show anymore. So he's this pedophile character has not yet crossed that line for me personally. And I have to emphasize your mileage on this one will vary. And for a lot of people, it will be an instant deal breaker. And I get that. And it's a real shame because the rest of the show has a lot going for it. So uh, we should probably move on. This It's a shame because School Babysitters probably is now in the it's complicated category. Um, there are no yellow flags yeah. in this one. There are red flags, but there are also green flags. So... Um, speaking of which, Citrus, mm-hmm. either mm-hmm. of you watching that? Yep. No, I, so I'm not great with, I tend to prefer my romance is fluffy uh, anyway. So Citrus was kind of going to be a tough sell right off the bat because it's kind of, it's more in that sort of melodramatic category. Um, Absolutely. And then, and then it was so heavy on assault. Now that's my other big, that's my, one of my biggest deal breakers is uh, lack of consent. So I was done with, <laughs> I was pretty done this with Citrus beauty. after the first episode. <laughs> yeah this yeah it's it is not a show for you and it's not a show for a lot of people actually i think it's fair to say um but i i feel about it the way i feel about school babysitters that there are some things that are so off and the the use of non-consensual contact as a cheap plot device to kind of generate conflict between them or generate emotional response is yeah it's not it's not fun and it it doesn't add to the story, but they do it every episode like clockwork and it's a problem. But in the most recent episode, they actually have Yuzu, the main character, who is an excellent character. She's so good. She's a really interesting and kind of defiant, um, kind of unconventional young woman. And she is just really a kind of opinionated and independent and i i really like her yeah i liked you too in that first episode yeah she's so great and she actually calls out may on some of her more manipulative the more manipulative aspects of the way that she uses her sexuality and it's finally it's i don't mind at all you showing teenagers having problematic attitudes or approaches to sex scum's wish was full of it and i Mm -hmm. loved scum's wish yeah but the show doesn't address it and in episode six, it finally starts to address it. So it's too early to say whether it's turned a corner mm-hmm. or whether it's just temporarily like thrown as a bone. But it's it, it's slightly promising. And there are some people out there praising Citrus based on the manga. So maybe it's starting to go in more of that direction. I don't know. But I think it's worth it's worth checking in at the end of the season and seeing if we have anything to add about that because it is not the same show in episode six as it was in episode one or two. Mm -hmm. I think we were talking about how if you took out the sexual assault, it was actually kind of an interesting slow burn romance. Like if, if there wasn't any sort of initial kind of any of that going on, it would have been her like suddenly having a stepsister and not knowing how to handle the relationship, trying to be supportive. And then I think in episode six was also when they had the the first consensual kiss in the entire series. So that could have just come out of nowhere. Yeah. There's this whole moment where they're like, wait, this kiss is the other. What could it possibly be? (laughs) Because both of us actually wanted to kiss. That's weird. (laughs) Imagine that. It was, yeah, it was ridiculous. But like that, that could hopefully be a turning point where this turns into a real relationship between equals because uh. there is i mean there's some talk out there i know i know <laughs> there's some talk out there about um some people object to the show because they don't like the fact that they're related but they that doesn't bother me personally because they aren't they, it's not just that they aren't blood related like they only met maybe like days before their first kiss or something like that yeah so it's it, it's very much like two strangers come together and it turns sexual which is like the fact that they're they're related by marriage at that point is 
it's not a big problem for me i can see how it would be for some people but for me personally it's not a big deal it's the non-consensual contact that's the big deal breaker and will absolutely put plenty of people off i'm sure yep yeah that sounds about right (laughs) (laughs) the other one in this category is devil man cry baby we've done a whole podcast on that so go check out that podcast episode on it moving into the next category then feminist potential let's look at first of all laid back camp oh we're gonna start from the top yeah okay let's let's go to the ones that i think because laid back camp i think you're the only one watching it and violet evergarden i'm the only one watching it record of grand crest war i think we're all watching oh so. peter is also watching laid back camp i know because yeah. his tweets get oh. get lots of shares uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's true i shared a tweet of yours secret last society week. So blanket man Secret Society Blanket. It's <laughs> Laid Back Camp is wonderful. I love yeah. it. It, It's not my very favorite show of the season, nor is it the show that I would say is the best show of the season, but it might be the one I look forward to the most each week. Oh, um, really? Yeah, mm-hmm. it, is, it is a weekly dose of just relaxing, fun. It's, it is the perfect cute... It's a cute girl show. I'm putting cute girl kind of in quotes because it's basically the perfect cute girl show. It's these four or five girls... Uh, having fun, goofing around together, going on camping trips, and they're not fetishized or infantilized. They're just they're just cute high schoolers having fun, and it's really really enjoyable. See, that was what put me off was that it it came across like cute girls do cute things, and that they I kind of got the impression that they would be infantilized. Um, but that's really reassuring, and I know I know you guys have been into it, but you know I don't always like the same things as yeah. as everyone else in Anafem. So I wasn't quite sure, but actually if six episodes in, you're singing its praises that highly, I should probably check it out. I love it. Their their interactions remind me, I mean, obviously it's it's a comedy, so it's not like, we'll talk about this later. A Place Further Than the Universe to me is like a very realistic, is very realistic high school girls. Laid Back Camp yeah. is comedy high school girls. So I mean, you know, it's not, it's not like a perfect experience of high school or anything like that. Um, but the way they goof around together very much reminds me of like my friends and I like just wasting time and hanging out and like somehow somebody got wrapped in a box and now we're going to put uh, stamps on it and like pretend we're going to mail them <laughs> like just goofy stuff like that, you know? Um, they that might be a step too far for me. I don't know, but they, it sounds cute. They rib each other. Um, like, and it's, oh, I've, I've, it's, this is something I hadn't really noticed in anime until suddenly I didn't notice it in Laid Back Camp, is a lot of the time when you have characters kind of giving each other crap, it's usually like one person kind of getting picked on by the others, and then they're like, you know, and that's that's like the relationship. And in Laid Back Camp, the characters, it's, there's a really good back and forth. Like everyone's kind of in on the joke, and it very much has that feel of like friends kind of teasing each other, but everybody knows that they're just goofing around. Um, it's really yeah. nice. I like it a lot. Also, you can't really insult Nadeshko because she just rolls with it. Like when she's talking about Mount Fuji too much, Chiaki says, I'm just going to call you Fujiko. And she goes, dang, okay. (laughs) She doesn't want to say that. (laughs) She's like, that sounds great. uh, Yeah, yeah, that sounds nice. Uh, I mean, if you go with Fujiko, that's a pretty good name uh, if you're an anime fan, I think. Um, Yes. I think it actually did kind of the opposite because it almost immediately portrayed, uh, from the infantilization aspect, because it almost immediately portrayed um, Rin, I think it is, as a Mm -hmm. kind of a very self-sufficient individual. uh, who, And that's commented on a lot because she's always going camping by herself uh, in the middle of nowhere. And she gets her driver's license super early so she can get on a Vespa and go even further out in the middle of nowhere and continue camping by herself. Like, she makes plans, uh, itineraries. She keeps buying her own camping equipment. So you learn a lot about camping and, like, can actually see her being kind of this, I mean, kind of weird person, but also, like, uh, I don't know. She doesn't rely on anybody else, and she seems to enjoy camping on her own. Yeah, Alex wrote a really nice article about that on her blog, The Aficionado, which we're going to share in the links post this week probably yeah i think uh, they've introduced a lot of good side characters now too like smooth grandpa and uh <laughs> i i don't know if that drunk lady is going to become smooth their teacher grandpa. yeah yeah uh, basically his thing is he looks like he's in a coffee commercial um and he's like cooking this huge steak on a cast iron pan next to his motorcycle in his tent and Chiaki comes across him and he offers them to her. <laughs> and that was the entire scene. Yeah. And, and she's was, like, what a smooth know. grandpa. And he, yeah, yeah. He, he turns out he's kind of a recurring character. And then, yeah, they met, they met a couple of campers this past week, which was like a brother and sister. And the sister just like goes out and gets trashed and that's how she camps. And yeah. I was like, I can, I can oh, get behind that. Yes, I saw, I saw the 
uh, screenshots with her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I felt I felt a connection. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I I think that the show has also prevented itself from being formulaic. Uh, well, okay. not falling back on usual anime bad stuff. So I think it's done. A, it's it's really great. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. recommendation accepted. Mm-hmm. I'll have to check this one out. Um, I think I'm the only one watching Violet Evergarden because I'm the only one who has access to it. Uh, this is yeah. an, an unusual feeling for me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Americans. Uh, enjoy while it lasts. We're in the anime um, backwater here in the USA. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I can't feel too bad about this. Um, Violet Evergarden, I am watching. I haven't quite caught up, um, but I need to talk, I think, about how it's changed so it's it it has shifted now so it's not solely violet's story she is her job now is to write letters expressing the feelings of others and it gives her a way to kind of connect with other people and we can tell their stories through her work and episode five had something that i think we're going to need to talk about at some point in a bit more detail but basically she writes the love letters between a 14 year old girl and her 24 year old betrothed Um, neat yeah so that's uh, that's a bit uncomfortable because it is a love story and it's told as a love story so it begins it begins kind of being shown as a political situation Mm -hmm. and that the 14 year old is deeply unhappy about it which I thought yep fair enough you know if 14 year old girls did get married off for political reasons this is probably how they'd react but, you know, spoiler alert, guys, it turns out that she was in love with him the whole time and he um, is willing to return those feelings and it is framed very much as a romantic story. Triumph of love. <sighs> yeah, yeah, and Violet um, Violet supports this in a way that's totally appropriate and had it been between characters with a different dynamic, it would have been fine. But they also don't know each other at all um, and they're... It's yeah, it's all a bit uncomfortable and it's essentially like one of the questions that the, the little girl asks. The little girl, she's 14, that she asks Violet early on is what do you think about relationships with an age gap? How much do you think is too much of a gap? Do you think 10 years is too much? And I don't know, it, partly because of the conversations we've been having in fandom about After the Rain, mm-hmm. it felt quite... Uh, not on the nose exactly because there's no way they could have known about that um, or incorporated it into their anime in that way but it felt like justification which doesn't sit well with me really Um, so just be aware that that's there other than that it's been fine so I think it's their attempt to tell a a story of unconventional love because that that's the whole point of Violet's journey is she's trying to understand love oh and we learn in this episode that she's around 14 as well which changes things a little bit wow I hadn't yeah I hadn't really expected that she's she's asked how old are you and she says oh I I would I'm an orphan so I didn't have a birthday but I'm told that I'm around 14 which changes things considerably yeah um we'd I think we'd been working on the basis that she was around 19 mm-hmm yeah, no. So her her quest to learn about love, I think they're going to be exploring in different ways and different types of love. And this was, I think, their attempt to do a, a story of fairly unconventional love. And it's between royalty, so it's already a bit different. But yeah, it's it's a bit of a bit of a warning sign. So I don't think it's going to go down that road again. But it just that one episode alone you could probably skip it and be fine quite honestly if you think you'll be uncomfortable with that you could probably just skip episode five because it is vignettes now um there's an interaction that happens at the very end of the episode between violet and somebody else that's quite important but other than that probably not that necessary watch the first two minutes watch the last two minutes just skip it in the middle i do have one question about um, that because i watched the yeah. the first episode screening at expo and um oh, yeah the premise, or at least the way that the men were treating Violet, seemed very super paternalistic, which was one of my super big concerns for the series. Mm-hmm. Uh, like they, I read, there were a couple comfortable scenes where she's like begging them to tell her if her commander's still alive, and they just won't do it. And it's obvious he's not, but they just they want to save her feelings, and then they keep. I, they're talking about how they're going to kind of like arrange her life so she can learn how to become a human being, and I was like. 
I, to myself, I was thinking, I wish they would just walk it back and let this kind of happen on its own or, like, see if they could support her. Um, yeah. So I wasn't sure what sort of trajectory this series would take from that kind of uh, potentially problematic launching point. Yeah, and I'm again, I'm not completely caught up, so this may be contradicted by the, the most recent episode, but my understanding is that the the element of not giving her all the information she needs to function as an adult and to, to own her feelings and grieve accordingly, they haven't done that yet. Mm. Um, and it doesn't seem like they're going to. I imagine they're saving, at this point, I imagine they're saving it for an end of season kind of emotional climax, which feels, I, I don't like it. I would rather she spent the series grieving yeah. and learning how to grieve rather than learning what love is. Yeah, so th- there's like two outcomes. Uh, like uh, when you p- put it that way, it's either she goes through all this trouble learning what love is just to learn that that guy died <laughs> before episode one started, uh, or... Yeah. Uh, he miraculously survives, which will kind of feel a little like an anticlimax, I think. Yeah. 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 That's I not mean, great. It, they, they still could, <laughs> but there's, there's, I mean, they've, they've kind of implied heavily that he's dead. Oh, they've yeah. Like I, heavily. I was like 100% so sure. If like, they, if, if, if he's, he's not, not, it's bad uh, yeah. based on the first episode alone. Yeah. If he's not, it's, it's baiting the audience which i don't believe in like if you want it to be ambiguous there are ways they can make it ambiguous for us as well Mm -hmm. as for violet and they've not done that they've really heavily laid the the grounding for he is dead and violet just doesn't know yet yeah and she doesn't know and she asks with great distress oh yeah often and that's hard oh more Um, after episode one yeah yeah she asked repeatedly oh Oh, my god a lot she's she's upset and i but it's, like, her response is the reasonable one. That's, like, the only time you see her get emotional is when she's, like, basically, like, pleading with them to tell her uh, oh, yeah. where the, her, yeah. like, leader is. Oh, that, uh, I don't she like She continues to bring him up when she takes the, the doll class. That's the name of her job title is doll. Yeah. Um, when she takes a class for that and they say you have to write letters to somebody and she, um, she they, they try to encourage her to write a letter to the, the guy that she's... I think that's right. Do you know what? I'm fudging I'm fudging details in my memory at the moment. But basically she continues to think about him. She continues to want to contact him. She continues to ask about him. She continues to speak as if he's alive yeah. and she doesn't get contradicted. Is she still sending reports back? Um, I don't think so okay. because she's with uh she's with her new commander. Guy, he handed off guy. Yeah, commander or whatever. Her new okay. Boss. But I will say that is the extent of the paternalism okay. for, the, for the large part so it's that first episode is really unfortunate in that sense because they do have to get her from hospital and alone and isolated into an independent situation relatively speaking um they try to put him in her commanding officer family's home and that doesn't work she resists she she wants to be active and useful um and then she she ends up going with the uh, other military guy to his business and so she works there she lives there she asks for the job that she has writing letters is actually a job that she asks for and that happens at the end of the the first episode and so that is a real step in the right direction and learning her her letters to begin with are very much reports and she has to kind of take on other people's guidance and input to learn how to inject emotion into her letters and that kind of thing so over time she is becoming a more fleshed out person with more agency but that yeah it, it's it strikes me every time that she brings him up and they don't say anything to her and it feels uncomfortable yeah i forgot but, she was staying at his family's house too <laughs> they well they tried to get her to stay there they tried to and she refused she leaves okay good she leaves because they the implication is that she wouldn't work and she said no i want to work okay basically so she she just finds it it's a it's a reasonable thing she's trying to adjust from child soldier essentially to civilian life mm-hmm. and she feels like she can't do that without a job and she she wants to stay connected to her commanding officer in some way and she doesn't feel like she can do that in his family's home so it's a lot of i mean this is a really beautiful show i have to say this is a really beautiful show i do really enjoy watching it that is the one thing that is really uncomfortable is that she is so distressed by her commanding officer's absence and she has clearly been responsible for some dark things as a child soldier and they haven't really gone into that yet but she's she's got some trauma 
and they're not really addressing it and they're not really enabling her to address it as a character so i'm sure they'll get to it they've they've laid enough groundwork that they have to i think but they haven't so far really um though you know maybe, maybe episode six picks it up i'm not sure cool we, right. we should move on yep. to record of grand crest war which i think all of us are watching yeah yeah excellent you tell me what you think i'm a little disappointed in it um i mm -hmm. i think that uh the extremely cool female characters have been overshadowed more and more by the uh less cool uh especially i mean theo's fine i guess he's just not very interesting <laughs> Um, everyone is more interesting than Theo, basically. Um, that's true. And but Seleuca and Theo is, that's a dynamic I have a lot of time for. I would like it better if I felt like Seleuca was still getting to do, we know that she's kind of the mastermind. Like uh, the episodes usually start with her being like, Hey Theo, go do this thing. And he's like, okay. But <laughs> because we spend so much, because the narrative spends way more time on Theo doing the thing than on Seleuca coming up with the plan it ends up feeling unbalanced within the narrative itself, I guess, in the, in the more recent episodes I felt. So less Celica on screen is, is a, is a mistake. I think. Um, Theo is a mistake. Theo's fine. Well, also they are working just... for that guy now who's basically making, he's calling all the shots now. So it, yeah, she's Celica's just following to. orders. So, but yeah. she's following orders, but she's coming up with, he's like, Hey, go take this castle town. And she's like, okay, well let's come up with a plan to take the castle town. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. she'll come up again. She'll come up with the plan at the beginning of the episode, and then Theo executes the plan. And it's so like I know on I know like from an from like a big perspective level that Silica has a very active role to play in the story, but we just don't see very much of it, and that has kind of bummed me out a little bit the past few episodes. Um, That's understandable. Yeah, I feel like she's she's now in a kind of educational environment. She's learning. I do like I that. It was interesting actually that they they specifically mentioned her reputation didn't they she had gone to she'd learned a number of things but never to the level of specialty so she has a, a range of kind of shallow skills and information Jack of all trades but she yeah. doesn't yeah but she but she hasn't got a single thing that she excels at mm -hmm. so she's learning from these other women yeah and i thought that was quite a nice dynamic i liked I that scene that. i would have liked more of that it was like again it was like three minutes and i was like i want more time with these characters and silica yeah. hanging out with them um so what do you think of the um the guy himself villard the lostful earl that's his nickname isn't it yeah, yeah. and he um and he had he's the reason that she has her uniform which she's apparently got used to now because that was always going to happen yeah and and he has this 25 year old who's really into him and he won't marry her because she's a priestess or something and it's yeah it if i completely get what you're saying Dee, because it does feel like it's shifting to a story of men whereas it started out feeling much more balanced mm -hmm. um and it's starting to feel like it's going to be Villard and Lassic and uh, Theo kind of leading the charge in whatever kind of story sense they have. I don't feel like he's a good guy, though. So I, I feel like at some <laughs> point they have to break out from under his thumb. Uh, so yeah. I'm hoping that that, I don't know. He was super creepy in the beginning. Yeah, uh, as, I thought as he the would... hashtag woman respecter. So <sighs> I really wanted them to do something with that. But then yeah. they ended up kind of just giving him sort of a sort of a sympathetic backstory, which is fine, but maybe also address the fact that he like forces people to leave his service at age 25 so they because they need to get married and have children, even if they want to stay and work for him. Um, yeah. Like, and she specifically wants to stay and marry him. And he's like, no, I can't give you preferential treatment. Also, I hated women and my mother for a while, which is, yeah, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> by the way yeah that was that whole scene was a really kind of uncomfortable i felt like they threw revelation. A, i feel like they threw a lot on us in that scene and then didn't really give yes. us any time to explore that or digest it at all and maybe they'll come back to <laughs> exactly. it it's um, still moving very he's... fast the series i feel like it it's really slowed is. down but i still feel like it's going at a pretty fast beat and i'm wondering yeah. where it's trying to reach so quickly because uh, yeah. i think it's at this point it's going to get two seasons so um yeah, I think it definitely has more. time yeah I'm still enjoying the, the female characters that we do get. Like, that's one thing I do appreciate is there are new female characters regularly. Mm -hmm. 
and we we have had a range of them there was there's that episode where you walk in and it's like the the vampire king and the werewolf queen or oh my god castlevania and, episode yeah. <laughs> that, was <so> good. <laughs> that was so weird it felt really bizarre it but did. again in that episode you've then got two more women who's like dueling each other and that that kind of thing happens quite a lot within this series mm-hmm. and i appreciate that but yeah it does it it does have its uh, concerns it's so hard to tell where the series is going still i think is yeah. the yeah. big issue you're like what is the series about yet um yeah and- exactly and it feels in a way it feels like very short arcs so you have an arc that lasts an episode or two episodes and then it moves on to something else and that's it's an odd way to stitch a story together. Yeah. It's, and it does feel quite stitched together at times. And a lot of the time that will happen with uh, light novel adaptations, um, just because yeah. the way a light novel is written is every light novel is kind of supposed to be its own, uh, like, story. standalone type story. And then they, which, right. which are then, you know, kind of strung together in this, uh, in this, like, broader arc format. Um, and I think that sometimes that lends itself to a, a pretty organic like narrative like like single narrative and sometimes not as much and i get the sense that the way this one was written was probably like and now here's this pitch battle and now here's this conquest and so trying to pull those all together into one story is um probably a bit of a challenge yeah. well that makes sense. it's hard not to think that it's got some sort of objective with the director of the series so refresh my memory it's a uh, mamaru uh i hope i pronounce this correctly yeah. Hatakayama. Hatakayama. yeah 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 Hata- uh, the director Hatakayama. of rakugo yeah he did rakugo he's oh. done he's he's very good the this yeah. if nothing else this show has has proven to me that we should definitely give him like action series because the action sequences are excellent they're yeah. i mean they're they're well animated and that's not him necessarily but um they're very well directed there's a lot of um this isn't feminist relevant so we we might want to cut this out <laughs> of the actual <laughs> podcast but um there's very much a focus on um kind of the claustrophobic chaotic aspect of fights like there's there's an actual sense of like weight to the battles yes. and i really appreciate that i found the um the the one where milza goes in and just kills everybody except that one guy and he's it, it, it felt dangerous mm-hmm. and it felt creepy and it felt intimidating and I thought that was that was nicely done for sure but then there was that really awkward dance between Villard and Margaret that, where it was oh kind my of god to be kind of yeah it was supposed to be really sexy <laughs> and it was supposed to come across as kind of a metaphor for for them having sex yeah not a metaphor quite but you know what i mean yeah. it was supposed to come across like this is the equivalent they're really into each yeah. other and it was slightly awkward and cringy it was so it, it was yeah was, her spinning in that circle around him just was weird <laughs> there's one moment where she's just like breathing really deeply for no apparent reason while he's totally fine yeah um, <laughs> yeah so that was a weird it was scene. it was a little bit cringy um so maybe his action like when there's like fighting involved is a bit more solid yeah i find everything with Valar very strange because again i i don't know they set him up to they set him up in the first couple episodes to seem really like menacing and now it feels like they're kind of trying to do an about face and make you kind of sympathize with him yes. but i super don't because yeah. he's still doing that like what was that hashtag women respecter peter yeah um no one respects women more than I do. <laughs> that that put them on a pedestal thing. And, like, you can kind of get it with, again, if, if it's something they're going to keep coming back to and maybe addressing and challenging, um, then, okay, yeah, give him, a, give him a kind of a sympathetic backstory and then force him to sort of deal with those prejudices and realize that they're, you know, shitty. Um, and I just don't know if it's going to do that or not. Like that episode was very baffling to me. I didn't really expect him to, him to turn into that, to to turn into a character we're supposed to sympathize with, I think. Yeah. It did, it did feel like an info dump to evoke sympathy rather than building the groundwork for a character development. Exactly. I didn't, I didn't get a lot out of it except, oh, you, you have issues with women. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) That was, that was my big takeaway from the scene. And he says he doesn't. (laughs) <laughs> how convincing is that yeah. do we think yeah, he super does though his his actions speak yeah. louder than his words so exactly but i am enjoying it overall i'm i i get a lot out of each episode i do genuinely i'm into the sh- the show but i don't know how feminist a recommendation i would give it i guess yeah i don't feel like it's I a yellow it flag feels like, necessarily no but but it still feels like it has potential that it's not exploring yeah 
Yeah, I would agree with that. And six episodes in, I'd kind of hoped that it would it would build on well the promise that we saw in episode one. Yeah, yeah. me too. Okay, we, speaking of which, we should move on to feminist themes. Sure. Uh, we've got three shows in this category. Mm-hmm. Let's start with Samrio Boys, which I love. <laughs> I I yeah. caught up with it yesterday. I like it. And I I'm, I keep thinking yeah. I'm not. I keep thinking. Oh, I I think I'll. I'll stop watching, um, but then it, yeah. it pulls me in again. Um, it's a it's a very good toy commercial. Peter, are you watching this one? I am not. You should. I mean, yeah, I, it's one of the ones I'm actually interested in checking out. It's just uh, I think I'm up to twenty series that I'm following concurrently, and uh, I don't need to hear your excuses. Peter. Just, just watch the <laughs> just show. Watch I'm Samuel doing my Boys. best. <laughs> just watch Samuel Boys. Come on. It's, yeah, I mean, it, we talked about in the first episode, uh, sorry, on the, in the premiere review and in the three episode check in about how it's really trying to kind of dismantle some toxic masculinity elements. And I think it's doing a good job of that. And it's exploring from different angles the problems that people have in general with the idea of men liking typically feminine things. And I, I after the first arc with the main character, well, he's not really a main character anymore. He's, he's, kind of one of an ensemble now but the first arc with Kota who's kind of our every boy Mm -hmm. character I really didn't know where they were going to go with this and now six episodes in I really like where they're going with it which is they are approaching it from different angles through different viewpoints having people kind of be faced with their prejudices and try to come to terms with it the last two episodes were very BL. They were very like it was a romance story. Yeah, between it's. Uh, I'm and... not. I'm not great at picking up on subtext in most in most <laughs> media. Need to be. Um, <laughs> but but boy howdy, um, the subtext between Rio you and the really president didn't need to be. Uh, yeah. was not subtle. So no, not at all. And it, in a really nice way, actually, because it kind of felt like they weren't trying to hide it. So in this episode, they like the, the idea of liking Sanrio. Basically, they're talking about liking boys. That is absolutely the story they're telling here. Yeah. I'm like, I'm sure there are other readings of yeah. it, but this is. Well, it felt like this is what they were trying to say. It is framed like a romance. It is framed like BL specifically. Mm-hmm. The the character types you've got in here are character types who show up in relationships in BL a lot. You're talking specifically about the last two episodes. The last two yeah. episodes, the ones before that, I think you can read it that way, and it seems like there are moments when they set it up to kind of tease you a bit Mm -hmm. but it doesn't feel like that's the story they're telling whereas the last two episodes it absolutely felt like that was the story they were telling yeah yeah i would agree with that and it's it's a good story it's it's a kid who is clearly closeted and has internalized homophobia and he really struggles with his own feelings and about being he being perceived as feminine being perceived as cute he hates it he rejects it he wants to be more manly and he is resentful and lashes out against those who seem more comfortable with their identities. However, Vry raised a really good point that in our group chat that I think we should talk about, which is that this is a trope and actually it's not yet balanced out in any way. So we have um, the the character Yu, his sister is, she's, for, as far as we know, she's a cis straight woman and she really resents her brother's interest in Sandio. She really hates that he likes cute things. She finds it really embarrassing. And so she's cruel to him as a result. And they kind of resolve their differences and reestablish their affection for each other, but she's still struggling with it. And that's that's a perfectly decent story to tell. And it's a fer- perfectly valid viewpoint to show, but we don't have the equivalent of that in a male character yet. Mm-hmm. So everyone who seems to hate Sandio actually secretly loves it. And just is coming to terms with that. Yeah, or so or like need to... or like Kota's two friends who don't really get it, but they're they're fine. Like they're pretty accepting about the fact that he's into it. You know. Yes. So we haven't yet had anyone who objects to it because so many people in society do, and they haven't really shown that representation yet of somebody who doesn't like it and has to deal with the fact that that is just a prejudice yeah. and it's not right. I mean, now that I'm thinking about it, in the first episode, the whole reason Kota rejects. Uh, uh, his 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 pupper pom pom pudin is because of those boys who were giving him shit. Um, yes. So we've we've seen it, but we haven't seen it in the mod in the current day. And I think that was a good call in the first episode to make it be the boys teasing him because, um, you know, I think that it kind of points out that a lot of those pressures are placed on boys by other boys. Like that's yeah. you know what I mean. Um, and at a very young age. Yeah, well. and at a very young we age, and that's good. Very young. And so yeah, I think I think that. 
if they're able to bring that back over the course of the second half of the series um, as uh, it seems like these guys are probably going to do something for the school festival that will like very much um, make their love <laughs> of Sanrio like loud and clear. Um, really public. Yeah. yeah. And so if and so I'm hoping that over the course of that arc, we'll we'll have us we'll have situations where they're where they meet some these maybe some asshole boys their own age who they kind of have to deal with that because um, like like Vry was saying in our uh, private talk that would help balance that out a lot too I think so absolutely and it's really important too like I didn't I didn't really think about it until they pointed it out and then and then once they they explain what they meant I I completely agree I'm 100% on board I think that it is important to tell the story of the the young closeted boy and I do think that there will be, this is aimed at a fairly young target audience. And I do think that there will be queer kids watching this who see themselves and their responses in that and who can gain something positive from it. And I think that's a really important message to send. Um, but I also think this first six episodes has been building up their network. They need each other for support. And we're finally at a point when actually the whole team is assembled. So that didn't happen until this episode, this most recent episode. Yeah. So from here is kind of the time when you'd expect them to be challenged as a group, um, as well as individually, I'm sure. But the, now is really a good time for that kind of challenge because it won't be able to hurt them as much. And this is, at the end of the day, a, a toy commercial for younger people. So we don't want them to we don't want to kind of see them experiencing trauma, but we do want to see them kind of being having their having their their tastes questioned and then them challenging that and hopefully getting to a, a new normal where everybody's on board with it which i think as you said is what we're getting with the school festival yeah which by the way was the opening scene and really confused me <laughs> when i first watched the flash it. forward that first yeah 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 it really threw me i was like this is not what i was expecting from this show but it's turned into a really, I, I really enjoy watching it as well. I think it's important to say, like, we're talking a lot about how meaningful it is, but I actually enjoy watching it. It's fun. Yeah, it is. It's fun. It's got a pretty good sense of humor. Um, it's got, I mean, it's it's well written. It's every, you know, it has various different narrative arcs that it puts you through and you kind of get to feel yeah. for the characters. And I think they all have their um, their good points and their flaws. And yeah, yes. so I'm and enjoying it. the characters are written really consistently mm -hmm. as well. It's not like as soon as they like Sandio, like whoever they were before then, or as soon as they can acknowledge they like Sandio, whoever they were before is completely dropped. They just, they, I think like Kota, for example, they go back to him uh, having his love of Sandio questioned. And the first thing he does is withdraw into himself exactly as he did before. Yeah. And it takes, he has to kind of learn to be more comfortable with it. They don't just drop things. And you has these kind of anger issues almost. He has a temper. Out a yeah. He has a temper he... and they don't, sugarcoat that no well and he's it's very much he doesn't particularly care if people talk crap about him but if they start talking crap about his friends then he kind of goes off um yes because that was that was kind of what got him what got him off with with his sister and then with rio as well so yeah. exactly um, and it's that is consistent yeah and that it's is who he continued to happen and he's continuing to try to work through it and yeah i think it does a, yeah. a good job of that so it's not like everyone's problems are magically solved by no. uh finding loving Sanrio. yeah by loving Sanrio and admitting that you love Sanrio. so because actually that's a story they could have told and oh, they're choosing not yeah. to which i do appreciate they are actually this story is cumulative and it is going somewhere and the the more it goes on and the more they build up their own support network as young men with unconventional tastes that are kind of challenging these societal norms like that it feels really satisfying to watch them grow in their kind of strength of will and kind of comfort with their own preferences like it's it's a nice story to see it is i like it and a lot. it was completely unnecessary for this toy advert <laughs> okay next one dame pre anime caravan you're watching this oh of course i'm watching dame pri <laughs> i yeah dame pri probably is my favorite show of the season just because it was made for me um yes it was <laughs> it's continued my i guess my one my one sort of mild disappointment um going forward it's pretty much the same show it was in the first three episodes so if you liked it early on you'll you'll continue to have fun with it um <laughs> my Good. My only kind of mild disappointment is I thought they would go they were going to maybe delve a little more um seriously I guess into the boys and their arcs and like their kind of character development and they've continued to be pretty much just goofballs um but 
That having been said, they're very entertaining goofballs. The series has done a good job of finding uh, different dynamics. So, like, they'll smash two different characters together for an episode and see what they're like when they interact with each other. Um, and so that gives you, like, different aspects of their personalities. Um, the most recent one paired Narek and Mayer together, which was the odd couple romance I never knew I wanted until I saw it. Um, Ani's still... I need to see this. Ani's still fantastic. She's she's a she's a great uh, character. There's an episode... Which I don't think you've seen this one yet, Amelia. Um, I think no, it was I think yet. it was episode four. They... All the guys come... All the princes and their, like, vassals come visit her country. Um, yeah. And... They're very hard to deal with. And um, Nara keeps kind of talking crap about, like, what a backwater country it is. And uh, Ani is, she's still very, like, polite and diplomatic, but she does not put up with it. And I really appreciate that about her. Um, There's one part where they're causing a scene. They're about to have an international incident at the marketplace. And uh, she kind of gets between them and tells them to knock it off. And uh, Nara yells, like, you can't tell me what to do. And she's like, yes, I can. You're in my country. Um, <laughs> and I was like, yes, thank you, Ani. So she's she's still, like, she's very good. Um, she's And she's she gets to be goofy, too. Like, she's not just, like, the perpetual straight man. Um, oh, that's good. In the most recent episode, she got stuck in a room with just Chrome, who is very... Uh, <laughs> he's very unhappy at that point in the story for for lots of different reasons, but he's like the like the tension in the room is is in is insane, and she's trying to get she's trying to figure out how to diffuse it, and she looks over and her little animal companion Grimaru has just decided to pretend to be asleep, and she's like I'll do that too, <laughs> so she just pretends to be asleep like in the middle of their conversation, and it's very wow. goofy, yeah, um, it's yeah, so it's. It's very much playing in that kind of Oran High mode of taking the uh, sort of Atome VN genre and then uh, very lovingly poking fun at it. Um, and I'm having a really good time with it. So uh, as far as feminist theme, I mean, we put it in feminist themes because we did have kind of a main female character in a position of authority. And I think it's done a pretty good job of... Um, making sure that Ani has things to do and never gets like completely, you know, uh, run rough shut over by these idiots, um, that she has to deal with. Um, <laughs> I don't think I would call it actively feminist, but it's very feminist friendly and I'm having a lot of fun with it. So that's a good enough recommendation. And I saw the first three episodes and I loved it Yeah, and it is just, it was hilarious. So I'm looking forward to watching more of it. We have one more show in our list. And I think this is the big Anifem recommendation of the moment. I think it's fair to say. Yeah. That's yep. a place further than the universe. We're all watching this, right? Yeah. Yes. I think all caught up. I think almost yep. the entire staff is watching a place further than the universe. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's so good. It's so good. Um, Peter, you're watching that one as well, right? Absolutely. Are you totally caught up? I'm completely caught up, yes. I watch it the day it comes out every day. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, I'll call it. it's in the middle of the week, so it makes it easier. Uh, but it's also just <laughs> really good, and I want to see what happens next. So it's a really good show. I'm not even quite sure what to say about it. It's like it's just that good. Yeah. Everything about it is good. Yeah, there's pretty much been no problematic elements. I I really like all the character writing. I you get a very distinct sense that they actually like haven't even determined like the differences with the characters in regards to like how they act or i mean because characters always like there's there's like archetypes right uh, behavioral archetypes you can use to kind of write characters but they've gone a level deeper than that to determine how each of them like resolves conflict in different ways um in both like funny ways and in in dramatic ways like they have um should i say uh how she's awkward unless she feels like someone's uh, judging her, and in which case she kind of goes into combat mode, and that yeah. doesn't happen anymore, which uh, the other characters have sort of used against her uh, at certain points to get her to be proactive. Yes. Um, and then, of course, her big uh, argument with, um, oh, I forgot her name. Hinata, Hinata. Is it Hinata, yeah, yeah, in the, in the airport. So I just think that all the characters seem really real. It's had some excellent moments. Uh, like, one of my favorite moments, uh, I think, was episode three, where they bring on uh, Shiraishi. Uh, her whole... The, mm-hmm. the I think one of the most dramatic moments in the entire series so far was when she got that text notification that the other two people had left the group, uh, which I thought was some super elegant writing, and like managed mm-hmm, to make yes. something very mundane like extremely impactful. 
So I like the writing is really excellent. Uh, God, they haven't even started going to Antarctica yet. I think they're probably going to get on the boat the next episode. So it did a lot of building up, and there's like a lot of historical concept, uh, context with uh, Shidase's mother. Um, and I am glad they're like visiting the old, uh, the last people who went to to kind of build some context. I have no idea where they're going with it yet um, because, I mean, I doubt she's going to find her mom alive and well in Antarctica or something like that. Um, but yeah. whatever, like, sort of connection to her mother she's chasing, I'm I'm really curious as to where they plan to end up with that event because I feel it's, like that's going to be super important for the story. It's going to be devastating yeah, as well. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just prepared yeah. to... I, I cry at most of these episodes, yeah. I think, in some way. The writing, I, I would say it's the best writing of the season. I think it's the only one that I would describe as a pure uh, character drama. I think that they could ta- they could tell a story with these writers and these characters without going to Antarctica, and it would still be absolutely fascinating. Yeah. So that's I think it's incredible. Maybe I'm overstating it, but I th- I think that it's truly accomplished work, and we see a lot of praise in anime fandom for the animation side of things a lot but actually this it's it's a pretty series but the real draw for me is the fact that everything is so grounded in character it's so driven by character everything makes sense nobody does things unmotivated and it takes the opportunity to explore these characters individually and in their kind of pair dynamics and in their dynamic as a group of four and inter- interacting with the adults and it just explores it from every angle and it's so satisfying to watch. It is devastating in, in small doses. There are moments that are absolutely heartbreaking. And Shirase coming to terms with whatever's happened to her mother. And like you say, this connection that she's chasing, once she reaches that point, it is going to really hurt. But it's going to be so well written. And it's going to be Earned. absolutely grounded in who she is and the journey she's gone through. It's not going to be a cheap ploy to make you cry. So I have full confidence in how they're going to handle what is going to be an upsetting story. Well, I mean, I think it will be upsetting, but I have a feeling it will ultimately be um, Bittersweet. inspiring and upbeat because I like, I mean, we're talking about how every episode um, there's a moment that like maybe brings tears to our eyes. And that's definitely been the case for me. But there's also been yes. at least one moment every episode where I've laughed out loud. Um, oh, yeah, the, that's, yeah, the that's humor, the, the optimism, the sense of, the sense of fun in the story is also, um, it's, it's doing everything really well and it's balancing, um, those emotional beats with those, with those moments of, of teenagers being goofy, um, in a really, really wonderful way that I think makes, I think, I think I have, I tend to get a little bit exhausted sometimes with stories that are pure drama. Um, I think those, those light moments, um, help those help those uh more serious beats land and i think that the way a place further kind of shifts between the two modes um is very artful and brilliant and um you know definitely i mean credit the writing but a lot of the story is told through the visuals and the character animation and it's it's a it's a complete production yeah that's true and i don't want to undersell the elements you're talking about when i say drama i do i do just mean exactly what i said is that they could tell this this story with these characters without any big circumstances around them and i think it would still be an amazing show because i think that's well, that's where everything's rooted is in the fact that they've got these very complete humans that they're telling stories about yeah so that's that's what i mean by that i don't mean drama necessarily in terms of seriousness um even the the kind of comedic moments that they have is purely out of the fact that they've written such fully fleshed out characters mm-hmm. if that makes sense oh absolutely so, it's yeah and I, I i think you're absolutely right like i don't want to underplay either the part that the visuals are playing in it that it contributes both to the funny moments and also to the to kind of underlying sadness of some moments and the balance that it achieves is amazing it is almost all of the episode is like entertaining and light and and fun and then it just hits you with something that it does bring tears to your eyes but it's been so worked up to it, it earns like, its, its moments they, absolutely it earns those moments completely and i just enjoy every episode oh and i just want to give a shout out to the fact that we see so many professional women in active roles as explorers and scientists and it's 
that's really gratifying and something that we don't see a whole lot. Um, and they, they work with men, so it's not just like an all-female world or anything. Yeah. We, we're in this situation now where they're just surrounded by accomplished professional women that they can look up to and work with. And that's so great to see. Yeah, it's kind of surprising they're walking in basically the footsteps of uh, of the, the previous expedition with Shirose's mother, uh, which I, I didn't really expect uh early on it, it seemed like what she actually wanted to do was very unusual um but then you kind of learn that her mom also did it basically right out of high school with a bunch of friends um who kind of uh some of them i think they met like later on through academic like you know like research teams and stuff like that um but like the the journey is very similar i, I kind of think it's interesting that they're like the second ones to be doing this almost and it's it's representation of teenage girls, I think, is second to none. It's the only one I've seen for a while where I see the these teenagers interacting and it resonates mm-hmm. and it feels like, yep, yeah, this, this could easily have been me and my friends at various points. Yeah. So that's something I hugely appreciate. It doesn't happen too often in anime. So when it does, I want to make the most of it. And I think I'm going to be watching every episode as soon as I can. Also a very accurate portrayal of what it's like to eat durian. <laughs> is that so? Uh, it, I've avoided uh, it. It's like, it's like gasoline with sugar in it is what it Ugh. tastes like. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. That's, that's delightful. Yeah, when she brought up the durian ice cream, I went, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, final, final notes. Is there anything else that either of you is watching that you would recommend that isn't on our Premier Digest list? Uh. You just want to give a shout out to Classical Lloyd. Always. When, Go on, when am I not giving a shout out to Classical Lloyd? I won't. I won't. I won't <laughs> get into. I won't get into sequels and carryovers too much with this one because we usually do that with our end of season anyway. Um, Classical Lloyd's still great. This season has more of a storyline, um, and it keeps kind of popping back to it. All the characters are wonderful. Uh, it's it's a delight, and I'm still so so happy it exists. Also, there's a three minute short called Michiri Neko that I would uh, highly recommend our. Um, listeners check out it is about just squishy cats being cute for three minutes every week and it's really very fun and clever sounds good uh peter anything you want to shout out uh always march comes in like a lion because it's like one of the best anime of probably the past 10 years uh it's amazing they concluded the the big plot that like i found was really I don't know, the super devastating plot in the second season, and now they're moving in. I was I was like wondering what, how they could top that, but they're doing some interesting things now. Of course, uh, it's because of the Olympics, they can't... I think they're taking a month break. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so I don't know. Yeah, they're coming back in in March. Uh, funnily <laughs> enough. Like a lion. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if they're just going to finish out the season then with like however many more episodes, like two at that point, I guess. Yeah. Um, but maybe they'll at least be super high production. I'm not sure. Uh, it's really good, though. Everybody should watch it. It's, like, an amazing story. Chico, we know, is a genius. So. Great. Gosh, I... I'm not watching anything. So I have, I have nothing to nothing add else. to that. I just thought I'd throw that grenade at both of you. Nothing that's recent. Nothing that's currently airing. I, I find it hard enough to keep up with the things that we have on the list. Um, but honestly, this season, it feels like there's a lot of choice there's a lot of stuff i'm enjoying Mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff i'm getting a lot out of i enjoy analyzing anime and there's plenty of food for that in this this season selection i think it's a strong season yep and surprisingly so i'm very happy with i really wasn't expecting much i really wasn't expecting much out of this season i don't think there were a lot of like hyped shows necessarily that i was excited for and then as we started watching it it was like this is pleasant oh this is pleasant too hey i like this one as well so that's been (laughs) great it's a good, uh, really good aperitif to the shonen uh, apocalypse that's happening next season as well. <sighs> yes. Yep. Yeah. More on that in three months. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's a good season. I think we're going to come back to it in our end of season recommendations. That's our next touch point, I think. Um, so, yeah, if you are watching anything on this list and have opinions about it that agree with us or disagree with us we're quite happy to accept criticism on this then do get in touch you can find our work at www.animefeminist.com you can find us on twitter at animefeminist you can find us on facebook at facebook.com slash animefem you can find us on tumblr animefeminist.tumblr.com 
And we do have a Patreon, patreon.com slash anime feminist, which is how we pay everyone who contributes to anime feminist as a writer, as an editor, as an administrator. We pay everyone. We're not quite breaking even. Um, we haven't quite got enough in our Patreon for that. So if you can spare a dollar a month, it really does add up. So please go to patreon.com slash anime feminist, send us a dollar a month to continue our work. Or if you send us $5 a month, you'll get access to the anime feminist discord where we talk about all these kinds of things as the shows are going out. So join us there, $5 a month. And thank you very much to Dee and Peter for joining me today. And we will see you in another six weeks, I think, for our end of season wrap-up.